Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Filio. I have the Matilda Swanson Gallery located in Clarksburg, Ontario. Welcome to In Conversation With. Our guest today is the incomparable Peter John Reed. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Can you give us a little description about, um, well, who is Peter John Reed? Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Do you have any formal art training? Anything pertinent you would like to share with all of your fans? I was born on Plymouth, England on a beautiful sunny day. And uh, there, I think there was a parade, but I don't really remember that. Um, and lived in England with my two brothers and two sisters. I'm a middle child and we moved to Canada in 1964. And um, we, I, when we moved to Canada, I was fearful of um, the uh, Indians and thought we were going to live in a log cabin and uh, had to run around naked. <laughs> and um, the... Uh, How old were you? I, I was uh, six. Okay. And should have might maybe know better, but um, I had only seen snow once before. Uh, and it melted in the afternoon. It was like an inch. We tried to make a snowman, but, uh, and when we came to Canada, the first Christmas in Canada, we were all given sleds and toboggans. And I don't think it snowed in Toronto until February or something. <laughs> so it was, um, but I um, think I was very fortunate to grow up in a good family and um, went to public school. And um, my favorite class was always Fridays, art class. And um also loved taking art classes uh in the summer i think those things that they do when they're trying to get rid of the kids or get rid of them. so i like to do art classes but um i went to an art high school uh cw jeffries uh i don't think it's an art high school anymore nothing to do with me but um which was a wonderful thing where i had four periods of art a day um, we had nude models. A interesting thing about the nude models is we had fully nude females, but the men wore jock straps, and never quite understood why that was. It, it was an Italian neighborhood, so it might have been the Catholic girls that um, required that, or that they're difficult to draw. I'm not sure. Um, the um, and then from there, um, I went to study fine arts. And then I went to study industrial design because I realized I did not have the discipline to be a painter. I took a year to paint and didn't actually finish a single column, a uh, single um, painting. And so I went back into school for design and trained as an industrial designer, which I worked at for a good part of the year of my working year life and raised a family. Uh, two kids, um, and um, both are uh, interested in art, but not actively pursuing it. And then I uh, grew up in Toronto and moved up uh, to where I am now and just absolutely love it up here. And then some other stuff happened. Some other stuff happened. <laughs> So obviously your parents were encouraging of your art career if they shipped you off to a, an arts high school. Or did all, um, you, did our, all your siblings go to the same school? Um, the art high school uh, just happened to be next door or, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, so you had to apply to get into the art program. But um, I applied in uh, grade eight, got in but didn't end up going, it started in grade nine, which um, in Toronto at the time, there's a junior high and a high school. And I chose to stay with my friends. And I, when I went, I went to that high school anyway. And after I got my biology textbook, the science textbook, the history textbook, the geography textbook, and my locker was jam full of books, I thought, fuck this. <laughs> and reapplied to the art department and um, got rid of most of the textbooks. <laughs> there was a driving force. I'm just not sure it was the creative force. 
So you mentioned in what is it? Industrial what? Industrial design. Industrial design. So, what what jobs did you have? Um, the what mostly, does industrial design mean? Industrial design. When you look at every product uh, around you, toaster, hair dryer, car, cars use industrial designers. Um, they like you have a fashion designer who designs clothes. An industrial designer designs products, everything from cars to trains to um, toasters to helmets to footwear, um, basically. And what it is, it's someone who understands materials uh, and also it's a cross between science and art. Uh, if you have an engineer do does a lot of the uh, design work, but it would look like a, a porcupine and a, plat a platypus was designed by an engineer. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's interesting because um, before I knew any of that really about you, because I'm just learning this today, I, um, I always described you as a sci scientific kind of artist. Um, Definitely, I spend a lot of time understanding what I'm doing. Yeah, which a lot of artists cannot go in depth that way to to um, figure out why or how. Whereas you've done it, you have the science of art figured out, sort of. And it's not that it's uh, particularly difficult. I think one of the things that allowed me to do that is I have an interest like can you say that again peter and can you say that I, again it's not understanding art is so difficult it's just i have a very keen un, uh, interest in understanding everything um including uh, like that's what i spend a lot of my time is i just google some subject and to learn about it um i i would love to just be a full-time student the rest of my life um what what other jobs have you had other than being an artist and industrial designer? Um, most of the jobs I had were when I was young. So I, my first job was a cook at the CNE, the Canadian National Exhibition. Then I got a job as a lumberjack, um, cutting down trees for this. Uh, me and my best friend got a job cutting down trees, and which is mind boggling that I, we must have been 17 with chainsaws left alone cutting down these trees. Really, where, was, where was this? Uh, it was north of Toronto. Um, someone had bought some land and so we were cutting a roadway and clearing uh, space for a lake to be put in. And um, So it was pretty funny. Um, I worked um, in Byway, a, a discount store that no longer exists. I don't know if you'd remember that, but and I worked uh, as a hardware specialist in a home center, kind of like Home Depot sort of thing, an early version of uh, Home Depot. I could see you doing that job. I, uh, I could see you very, being very good at it. I learned a lot uh, while I was there. Uh, I drove a government car. Mm. Uh, this is while I was in college, so I was driving, MP I drove uh, quite a number. I actually drove Premier Davis at one point. Not, I, I wasn't his driver, but uh, his driver was on the holiday and I filled in. Um, I, um, what, I worked as a Toronto cab driver uh, while I was in school. That, that nearly cost me my wow. um, uh, uh, college diploma because uh, I worked nights and went to school during the day and I slept a lot during the day. <laughs> um, then I worked as an industrial designer designing transit vehicles and worked, um, started my own company at that point and was doing industrial design and graphic design and basically uh, was hired by a company full time to do their graphic design. And um, lo I've always loved my jobs, but uh, it just the whole time I'm painting, 
And it eventually got to the point where I was reducing the hours I was working for the companies and painting more. And then it just, I just want to do it full time. It's because it's, I teach art as well. So um, it was just too much. Yeah, you've, you've uh, written many books on how to paint. You've taken your art classes or courses, art classes or art courses? What do you call them? Courses? Courses, classes. Courses. Really you've taken stuff. them, right. You've taken them on the road. You have Studio 20, which you operate out of your own studio. You have a very dedicated following of would-be artists. And even some professional artists take your courses. What was the impetus behind this other than the obvious um, need to become a, a revered art god? <laughs> well, I'm still working on that, but um, <laughs> uh, maybe just a semi-god right now. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> the, it, it started when uh, someone who I was working with uh, asked if I would teach them to paint, and I said, I don't know anything about teaching. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you know how to paint. You don't always know how to impart that knowledge. And so I said, well, why don't you go out uh, to my house and we'll just paint together. And so at one point there were two or three people. And this was the start of um, the uh, Studio 20. And at the time it was called uh, the Dollaramas. Um, because um, they bought all, all the material was bought at the Dollarama, the um, dollar store canvases and whatnot. Um, and so it just got to the point where it wasn't practical to have too many people in the house. I didn't have the large studio I have now. And so one of the guys that was a part of the group uh, said the S Timothy Christian School had studios on. Uh, available and so rented them mostly I rented it I needed storage I, I was all those paintings and whatnot and we have a relatively small house and you only so many walls and so rented that space and uh, now Studio 20 I think we we're in our maybe our 12th year I'm, I, I'm not exactly sure I'd have to go back but in that time I was approached whether I would start teaching for other um, groups and so I started teaching uh, I th think the first one was at the Chesley High School and then all over the place and I actually wrote the first book um, because um, I wanted it, like you need pictures to be able to explain something that you're teaching you can't do it in words alone and so the first book I wrote was they, I initially had just handouts that were getting expensive and a pain in the butt to produce. And so I um, created um, this first book, and now I have just about finished the fourth. Um, amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how that just spiraled, grew into something much larger, I guess, than you had anticipated. I, I, my whole life has really just been uh, me not doing much of anything and just shit falling in my lap and think, yeah, I could do that. And um, it's, I, I, I don't, I, I wish I was someone who'd go out and get there because uh, get it. And I, I'm sure I'd be a millionaire by now. Mind you, a millionaire isn't much anymore. But. Uh, no. Aren't you, aren't you already a millionaire? Please? I could be, I don't know. So you're the exception to the rule of those who can't do teach, right? I, I think there there's a lot of fine painters out there who are offering course, courses that can't teach worth a shit. And they're amazing painters. Um, and there are definitely a lot of people out there teaching who can't do. I'm not sure I'm prepared to say, uh, yeah. though my experience has been in college, that um, you're right, they can't. Mm -hmm. they can't do nor can they teach for that matter uh, there there really aren't that many good teachers out there that um that i like i've taken class with some very good painters but i have never taken a class with a very good teacher mm. interesting and, yeah uh, reading up on your background 
everything about your life has been creative to even attending an arts high school, as you mentioned previously. Having visited your home, every detail in your home and your property from the gardens to even the furniture is deliberate and creative. Um, all of this work to, is it to create, um, well, all this work to create your artistic paradise, is it to satisfy your, yourself visually or is it to satisfy the, the incessant urge to create? It is definitely the incessant urge to create, make. Uh, I mean, I just love making stuff. My favorite gift is always tools or materials. And um, like I've heard people say that people find a white canvas daunting. To me, it's just like, wow, what could this be? Mm. Same with a piece of wood. Like, oh, like, I mean, if I find some wood for free or something, like free is always great. Um, and you think, oh, shit, what could I do with that? And uh, I don't know if you saw our post lately, but um, someone gave uh, Barney and myself some paver pole. Uh, and really didn't know a lot about it and uh, had a lot of fun making, uh, I think we made four projects. Uh, but I've had enough of that. It, it's um, very mucky. <laughs> uh, I really don't, don't like getting my hands with that kind of crap on it. But right. yeah, I just absolutely adore making uh, stuff. Yeah, I was, I was surprised. I think the first time, first time I came over, I was just in awe of the, the whole property. And then when you gave me a tour of the house seeing all your woodworking and how detailed and how how creative it was it wasn't just oh i just built a bed there was there was the bed itself is a work of art everything you created well, that was an interesting thing because at, at the time i was doing a project for um the museum on mayan art and um it's uh it was um there was all these scraps of pine that I had ridiculous pieces to keep. And so I thought, wow, God, I could cut these small pieces out and build Mayan art on. So it's on the doors, on the drawers of the dresser, uh, on the closet doors and on the bedstead. So that really was driven by these scraps of wood that um, free is just so amazing when you're working. <laughs> Hmm. So was there a moment in your early days where you thought, hey, I'm pretty good at whether it was painting or sculpting, um, whatever it was that you were doing at the time where you thought, oh, I can, I'm, I'm pretty talented. I'm a creative guy. Um, it's... I don't know that I really had that much forethought about anything. I was doing what I wanted to do. And uh, I mean, I obviously had to think I was somewhat good to art to want to go to art college and whatnot. And that it just really has very much just one thing led to another. And even now, um, you know, I'm good, but uh, I just hope I live long enough to just keep getting better. It's just every year I think I'm that much better of a painter. It's one thing that I think that's amazing about being an artist is an athlete is going to reach their peak at 25 or, you know, and after that, it's a slow decline. But an artist, uh, it's as long as our mind is still living, um, we can just keep getting better and better. I must admit, I did go see the Alex Colville show. And I don't know how long he lived, but he was an older man, and I did see a decline in his work um, and the lighter pieces. And I think it's a combination. If we start losing our eyesight or um, uh, emotion, ability. right? Holding the way you emotion, hold the brush. Yeah. But I, there's a, a video online of um, Renoir painting, and he's crippled at this point, and an uh, assistant jams a cigarette into this hand, and he's puffing on a cigarette, and he's crippled like it but i i didn't see the finished painting but he was still going <laughs> uh, yeah i think it's mostly the mind that you've got to uh and the eyesight mm. i don't think braille paints really work mm -hmm. what do you start considering painting professionally versus it just being a hobby like your woodworking and your gardening 
Well, it, it's um, had to be, uh, it was getting to a point where, you know, there's only so many paintings your family wants and uh, your mother uh, has no more walls in her house. And um, I was actually thinking, well, I, I got to stop painting. Like, I, I mean, I can't keep mm. producing paintings. And um, it was Bonnie that said, well, we should um, take it to a gallery and uh, took it to the gallery and I had a sheet prepared of the paintings and still had some in the car and so I dropped and, um, and they they wanted to they said they try one and this is where um, the horseshoe that I had installed permanently up my ass um, <laughs> that painting sold the next day mm. and so, um, and it was a fl the, the right person came in at the right time. And so then they took more paintings. And I think, uh, I'm pretty sure I became their second best seller uh, within uh, a year, a year and a half. And so then uh, really, I've been approached by most galleries, not, yeah, I have approached galleries, but with very little success. Um, and, um, I was approached by one down in the States, um, and was signing contracts, but that whole free trade bullshit between mm -hmm. the was really, I didn't end up going through with it. It just, um, didn't like the feel of that disconnect. And I've never visited the gallery. It was in Cincinnati or somewhere and really didn't want to go to Cincinnati. <laughs> Wasn't Mary Tyler Moore uh, from Cincinnati? <laughs> show? Oh, you wouldn't know that. I can imagine. Yeah, what would you go to Cincinnati for? Oh, no, it was WKRP, the radio station. That's yes. Probably oh, you yeah. remember that? Yeah. I've seen it on Prime, probably. <laughs> I grew up up north where we're just about 20 to oh. 30 years behind oh. Ontario, right? Yeah, that explains the shirt. Yeah. And I thought, do I wear this or do I not wear this? I'd say you've got your suspenders down, though. <laughs> so you're general. This brings me to the perfect question, perfect segue. You, bring, you are generally a pretty funny sassy, and sassy guy who enjoys a little banter here and there every once in a while. I find it interesting that this humor is not so obvious in your paintings. Are your paintings more reserved for the serious and sensitive side of Peter John Reed? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I have a sensitive side. Uh, <laughs> Bonnie would probably concur on that. Um, <laughs> the, um, I've, I guess it's a, a lot of artists think that they have to say something with their painting. And um, I, to me, I've always, it's, it's aesthetic. I, it's the need to create uh, and the aesthetic of it. And um, the one thing about humor, uh, not that I've ever tried to put it into a painting, but watch an old comedy. It's not that funny. <laughs> the even ones that you thought were hilarious at the time. Yeah. Um, humor is very much a living, breathing thing. And um, I, I, I have, like, I mean, a cartoon is, uh, you can capture that, but so much of a cartoon, you take it out of context and you're just scratching your head wondering what the hell that means. Mm -hmm. Like, especially now, there's just a flood of COVID-19 uh, jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Toilet paper, lots of toilet paper jokes. Yeah, there, there's, uh, every morning I get an email with uh, something about, um, uh, that's humorous. Uh, the one that Bonnie was listening to this morning, it had uh, this woman had a list of things not to do or what to do with COVID. And it was saying, don't go outside. You have to. And if you have to, make sure you maintain a social distance. But it's okay if you, if you know the person. Or, uh, and it was just all contradictory. It's saying one thing, which is the information that we're getting. And it was really kind of humorous. Right. But Yeah. Yeah, no, I think what, what you do with your work I, I, is you capture the beauty that is that that we are living in, right? It's nature. 
and I just know how people respond to your work is that they just think it's just so beautifully it's a beautiful rendition of of our backyards of nature well that's an interesting thing because there's a lot of things i'd like to paint but it's very hard to sell um paintings that are not our backyard yeah in our backyard like um uh, yeah southwest paintings of the canyon like I, i'd like to go to utah but um i don't know what i'd do with the paintings uh, yeah they certainly yeah even i have that one painting that you did of the yukon which is Cam cameron falls i think it's called and it's a gorgeous painting and people love it and then it because it says cameron falls on the back and they ask me oh, where is it and i tell them it's from the yukon it's in northern ontario oh is it yeah i thought it was <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> don't pull my leg cedar I'm sure I could find one that looks like it in Northern Ontario. Well, I think it does. Other people have said the same thing, and but it's once they know where it is, or Muskoka. Selling a Muskoka, typical Muskoka scene here, it's just, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, even though they absolutely love the painting. Um, they just don't want Muskoka here. They want Muskoka in Muskoka. Yeah, I would buy a painting based on um, if I liked it yeah yeah um, <laughs> yeah same here i know bonnie's from uh from this area but i still bought the painting but uh, bought the girl <laughs> you can you can't have too much bonnie though no no such thing as too much bonnie no not possible no <laughs> how has your artwork changed over the years it's definitely a, a much greater skill uh, develop like I mean everything I do I'm uh, learning to express better it's uh, I guess it's like an author I don't know uh, you learn new words or you learn new ways of putting those words together to say uh, what you and one of the things that when most people are starting to paint they have a vision of what they want to do mm. and when they when they paint it doesn't look anything like the vision not even okay. close and I think that's one of the things as your skill develops, you get closer to your vision uh, of what it was that you imagined it would be. But it's still surprises that you roll with, like you're saying, wow, that's pretty cool. I think uh, I'll take that in that direction. So by no means have I got a clear idea that it always ends up that way. It, you go with the flow because amazing things can happen. Mm -hmm. The light bulb goes on above the head. Mm -hmm. So how would you summarize your, your style then? Um, style is not something I strongly uh, believe in. Style um, is something is just the, who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I um, like to paint very, very loosely. I like to paint very tightly. I, not to the, um, I did um, photo illustration at one time commercially, and I don't have a real interest in reproducing something exactly like, Cameras do a hell of a good job of that, and um, it, but I, it's I want to get um, the impression of that. Um, I don't like impressionists, but it's um, I'm sort of losing track of where I was going here. So the style is just who the way I move my hand. But I'm interested in seeing new work all the time, and you're bringing in what you see and what you uh, understand, and you learn new things. And so I hope to always be improving uh, and seeing farther uh, just how far I can go. Mm -hmm. well, people, people ask me about that. People at categories, right? They yes. want to know, is this impressionist? What is this, right? And I, I just, um, what I tend to tell people is you are an artist that I can uh, blend in realism so well with, abstract and when you're looking when you have when you're further away from the painting there's there's so much realism to it and then the closer you get the more you see how large the strokes are and how abstract and and seemingly random it all is and very quick strokes right and then so they're very different depending on how close you are to the painting whereas high realism you look at it it's the same however close or, or however far away it is and so yours tend to change depending on how close you are to the piece and 
and you've managed to blend the two extremely well. And uh, I think that's why people always ask me that question is what, what, what style is it? And I never have an answer for them. And then I go in and I say, you know, Peter's kind of a scientist kind of artist and, and, um, Labels are something they like having labels. art for mm -hmm. years. And um, it's uh, often a lot of those labels were like in the Impressionists um, came from a painting that had the title Impression of something. Yeah. And the movement hated the name. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's an overused name now. Yeah. And the cubists and like, I mean, it's... Um, it, one of the things that it's it's much easier to see the style in 20 years from now when you can look back at the body of all the different artists and say oh they were painting this way um but to me it's just really a level of, of abstraction you know, abstract expressionist you can't tell what the hell it is mm -hmm. and then every degree up to that so maybe we need a scale of one to ten so we have a realist, oh, he's a five, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or he's a nine, or he, uh, where 100 is abstract expression, he's actually, you know, 250. Yeah. But. What, I, what I generally say to people is that it's stylized. I say I don't like to categorize it as uh, impressionist or realist. It's stylized, so it's that artist's perception of reality. That's. I think we should push that scale thing, though. Okay. You start saying, okay, there's this is a photorealist is one, and an abstract expressionist is um, ten, and then right. you can start because I'm sure going through the gallery you can say, oh, okay, he's you right. can see that, and so we could give numbers, and so this can right. be the uh, Sarah Peter system. <laughs> uh, I think it could be the Peter Sarah system, not the Sarah Peter system. <laughs> That, that a floor, uh, the start saying, well, on the Peter Sarah system, it, it, he's a five. Right, he's, right. And I'll do, I'll do my best to say it with a straight face and as serious as possible with as much yeah. conviction. According to the Sarah Peter model, he is a three on the scale. Yeah. And uh, no, you said that it's the Peter Sarah system. The Peter Sarah system. Uh, you have to put Monet on that scale, and you can put Pollock. Pollock um, right, he, right. He's a 10. And right. Monet, I would think, is probably around a 3 to a 4. Yeah. And um, maybe a 5. But uh, I, I think that's a good way to do it. Because really, <laughs> when it comes down to it, uh, whether you, uh, the cubism is, it could be used on that system. Like, I mean, cubists. I mean, it, it, some of the paintings were cubes, but most of them weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then it's you can balance get, between uh, abstract and literal. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think Duchamp's new descending uh, descending a staircase it was considered cubist, um, but I think that it's a little iffy. But uh, it's a beautiful painting. Uh, and you can see, you can't really see it's a nude, but you can see it's a person coming down a staircase. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll write a book on classifying art. <laughs> and, and then we should have a category of is a, a, a B. This is a B. It's just a bullshit painting. That's <laughs> <laughs> in most of it. <laughs> I, I know when uh, we were at... Um, the AGO uh, and um, they had um, ropes around a Afghan, like some grandmother's knitted Afghan on the floor of the art gallery. Nothing, like it was just sort of draped on the floor, nothing. And that was the art. And uh, without the ropes, no one, more, someone would have thought that a homeless person had crawled in to sleep during the night. And then when I was in art college, there was a, a, a faculty show and one of the um, instructors from the experimental department had um, a pile of dirt uh, on the floor and the janitor that night vacuumed it up, probably cursing, saying, who the hell put this crap here? 
and uh, there was a big stink because his art was vacuumed up. <laughs> I said, no problem, I'll come back in. I can dig some dirt up and pour it in a pile for you. Oh my gosh. Well, it's like, it's like that um, banana, right? That was duct taped to the wall and it sold for $120,000 US at Art Basel. Was it a real banana? Wasn't it? I think it I was. Don't know. I don't know. Uh, because that would look like shit after a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. And how how do you take that home with you? Is it a, it's a, an interactive piece? You have to change the banana yourself. So then you're involved with the creation of the artwork. Yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely a lot of game going on where uh, all the power to them. Like if you can tell... <laughs> Right, if they can get tape. 120 grand, yeah, yeah I'll go <laughs> to duct tape a banana to the wall. Because <laughs> I, I look at you know an actor getting 29 million uh, for a role they're playing, and they deserve a portion of the profits, but uh, maybe they should just uh, make the movies cheaper to go to. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of art do you tend to gravitate toward for your own? What do you like to look at? everything um there there's uh, abstract um pro you know when i look at a realist painting i i'm impressed by the skill that it takes to do it but it really um uh, i i'm sort of much more interested in the more abstract more abstract than um i currently paint at and um i and i've been pushing in that direction um to but one of the things that's difficult is when you know how to paint, it's harder to paint loosely and more abstractly um, because mm -hmm. the ten, like when you do a stroke and you think, well, that's a beautiful stroke, but that doesn't look like it. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big thing of what I'm working on now. And I'm trying to work on that through speed. Um, uh, and speed just doesn't mean reckless. It just means uh, doing the stroke fast. So the stroke has energy. Uh, and, <coughs> and then, sorry, I get so emotional. <laughs> um, and then. Um, you want to grab a <laughs> tissue, Peter? Yes. This isolation hasn't got me used to talking so long. <laughs> um, so that the the paint, painting carries that energy that it was created in and i think that like I, i'm not a huge fan of jackson pollock's work generally but i i do like some abstract expressionists quite a lot but that's the one thing is that 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 those abstract paintings have a lot of energy in their um work and i just like to see something and there was a piece in a hospital when my son was sick that um I all every time I was in the hospital, this painting was out of the way, but I went to look at it. It was fully abstract, but I could see something in it mm -hmm. and, and just loved uh, that where, um, and it's a difficult thing if you do like representational to get to that point where it's enough, mm -hmm. it's enough to capture what you caught. And so that's uh, definitely what I'm working towards at this point. But at the same time, I do want to earn a living. So um, it's, it's always based on, I've, I've always had a strong view that, um, that we're a part of a village and we need to participate. And if I just want to do whatever, then um, I shouldn't expect to earn a living from it. I, I, I'm not a big fan of Canada Council grants. Mm -hmm. um, I think Mark is what, and we should be able and if we're not marketable, then we can do that in our spare time um, uh, and uh, or struggle through. I, I'm amazed that Van Gogh struggled through, uh, mm -hmm. but he did have his brother supporting him and uh, his work is amazing, like, I mean, has amazing value now. And it's definitely one of my top old painters. Um, but um, it's so I don't want there's a lot of things that I would do and think, oh, the, but people have to like it. Like, I mean, it's not, I'm just not in, I'm not on a desert island uh, pleasing myself.
Oh, was I on the desert island with someone? You I can't remember. Where you were with Bonnie. Oh, okay. And, and you had a boat. <laughs> oh, right. So I'm not on the island. <laughs> yeah. So you can leave any time. <laughs> or go back to it. <laughs> yes. I often thought it would be nice to have a door in the house that just opened up onto that island. So that on um, the miserable weather we've been having lately, I could just <laughs> onto the beach and uh, it would be nice. But a little much with the snow is, is shocking. Shocking, I think, yesterday for me. I'm looking out and thinking, why is there a snowstorm happening? Yeah. Well, we I zoomed with my daughter um, a couple days ago, and she was she bought a new house that we hadn't seen, so she was giving us a tour around the house, and she passed by a window, and there's mountains of snow outside, and think, well, thank God we're in Ontario. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, north too. Where. I have all my friends and, and family up north and they're on Facebook and I saw their photos. There's tons of snow, mountains of snow. It was shocking. Don't you have any friends down here? No, <laughs> just you and Bonnie. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> you need better taste. <laughs> so last question for you, Peter. Do you have a question for me? Um... Other than where did I get this shirt? Yes. Um, well, I, I've always been very impressed with you uh, at your age, doing what you're doing. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's a bit late for me to learn from that, I think. But um, you, uh, both Bonnie and I, think highly of you. And we're glad to be a part of uh, Matilda Swanson. Well, um, thank you, Peter. You're gonna well, make this me is cry. Brown nosing, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really, it's it's true. We are quite pleased that um, Matilda Swanson's around and is there, and we've always felt uh, good about you as a person. Um, a little question about where you're from, but you know, his saying even people from the north got to be nice. <laughs> um, and um, it's. I just hope you keep doing what you're doing because uh, it allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. And I'm pretty happy doing what I'm doing. Um, and I, I pr appreciate what you're doing now with these online things. It's, it, I think it was a good idea and um, a creative and you're quite a creative individual in your own right and a painter. Well, I think when we're creative, we're creative with anything, right? As you know. Everything we do is, is there's some sort of creation to it and we can't stop. So a lot of the people are on the sofa right now twiddling their thumbs, bored out of their minds. And I haven't been busier because I've had so much time to dedicate to, to my own creations, which is, you know, these videos. And, and uh, like I was talking to you about earlier, I have the gesso ready to prep some canvas and um, I'm just really excited for this time to dedicate a little more intentionally to the artist, to the gallery, and then to myself, because it's all, it's all one. It's all, we're all intertwined. And I feel the same way about you and Bonnie and, and several other artists, how I could You and Bonnie? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't <laughs> a little trouble this, getting that out. <laughs> I couldn't be doing this without you guys. Yes. And, um, and it was a crazy idea. I thought it was a crazy idea. And when I sent the email out to everyone, all of you jumped on the opportunity to do so. So without you, I couldn't have been doing this either, right? It's it's a 50-50 relationship. No one said no? No. Well, okay. some people had a difficult time because they're very, very painfully shy, but they said, no, we trust you, we trust your judgment, and we're going to try this. And I was quite, quite amazed that people took that leap. Well, you're pretty easy to talk to. Um, just on your questions, I was wondering why you had, how do you sleep? <laughs> what on earth made you think that was a good question? <laughs> or <laughs> well, I'm sure those, everyone who has a Peter John Reed on their walls, they're probably thinking, I wonder if he sleeps nude or if he's clothed, right? I, I think they're wondering about the gallery owner. <laughs> I, are you opening up with that question for yourself? Is that your question?
question to me, Peter? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I know what it's like to be in the sh in these shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I sleep <laughs> with my heels. <laughs> I sleep with my heels on. <laughs> and that's my answer. <laughs> Good answer. Thank you very much, Peter, for participating in our conversation today. And we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you very much. It was enjoyable talking to you. I haven't talked to anyone for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel very special, Peter. <laughs> <laughs>